All right, amen. James chapter 4 this morning. If you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of James chapter 4. And while you're finding your places in your Bibles, I want to ask you this question. Do you know anyone who always has to have their way? Do you know anyone who always has to be right? And maybe you can think of someone who can't get along with anybody. All right, James is kind of going to talk to us about that today. Uh, but I think about the generation that we live in. It is the my way generation. And uh, we've got a generation that is up and coming. And, and when we don't get our way, we, we throw a fit. And when we throw a fit... Uh, we're given what we want. And, and uh, that's just kind of the generation that, that, is, uh, that we're seeing today and experiencing. And let me tell you where that starts at. That starts back there in the nursery. I want that toy. And the other kid says, no, I want that toy. There's a thousand other toys to play with, but they want, they want their way because that's how our flesh is, isn't it? That's how we're wired. We want our way and we want what we want and we want it right now. And uh, that's, that, is, that is human nature, uh, perhaps at its worst, but that, that's the truth. And uh, that is the walk of worldly wisdom. The, the walk of worldly wisdom insists, I have to have my way. I have to have reg recognition. I have to have uh, things about me. When we walk in the Holy Spirit and when we, when we walk in heavenly wisdom, though, what we do is we prefer others before ourselves. You take the toy. <laughs> Uh, okay, you want to do it that way? That sounds like a good idea. We'll see if that works. And I don't have to have my way. And so I want to talk to you about this title this morning, Walking in Worldly Wisdom. Notice in James chapter 4, and I want to invite you to stand with me. As we read this text, James chapter 4 and verse 1, James says there, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. So let's bow together and pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary so that we could have a relationship with you. Lord, we just pray today that your word would speak, that your Holy Spirit would move freely in this service. Lord, we pray that you'd break our hearts for what breaks yours today and that we would be found walking in heavenly wisdom and not worldly wisdom. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You know, there is a great contrast uh, between the opening of chapter 4 and the ending of chapter 3. If you remember the end of chapter 3, uh, James closes there in chapter 3 with the thought of peace and the idea of peace. And now he opens in chapter 4 with turmoil. He opens with fighting and with strife and with war. And you know, it's unbelievable how fast that peace can turn to fighting and turn to strife, isn't it? In all of our relationships, it's unbelievable how fast, how, how smooth things can be going one moment, and then the very next moment there's strife, and the very next moment there's war, and there's fighting, and there's things that there's a disruption there, and there's division there. But one truth that we know for sure is this, y'all, God is not the author of confusion. God is not the author of our strife. God is not the author when I can't can't get along with my brother or my sister in Christ. God's not the author when I can't get along with my wife. God's not the author when I can't get along with my family or my friends. God, that does not come from God. Now let me tell you where it does, what the devil loves. The devil loves when there is strife and contention in the church. Boy sits over there in the corner and he's just eating it up. 
He loves when we are divided and when we fight and when we can't get along and when there is contention and while we spew hate and we seek to devour one another, perhaps in the name of God, he sits over and he watches with amusement. I don't know about you, but I don't want him to have his way in my marriage. I don't want him to have his way in, in our church. I don't want him to have his way in our relationships. But let me tell you what should uh, characterize all churches. Love and peace should characterize our church. Forgiveness and understanding and love and peace and getting along. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3. I want to show you uh, there what, uh, what, what he says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. Let's notice verse 1. Paul tells the church at Corinth, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. And so he says, I can't speak to you the way that I want to talk to you because you're not grown enough to receive it. You're not big enough to receive it. And look, notice in verse 2, he says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. He says, I can't give you a good steak dinner because you're not able to bear it. I fed you with milk just like a baby has to have milk. And he says, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not, not carnal and walk as men? He says, you're walking according to the thoughts of this world, to the wisdom of this world, to the desires of this world. You are living according to the world system. And he says, are you not carnal? Think about how this must have broken the heart of Paul. It had to have broken the man of God. Listen, the man of God doesn't like it when there's strife and divisions and contentions in the church. But how much more does it break the heart of God when there's strife and contention? Notice in verse 4, he says, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, he says, Are you not carnal? Notice what's happened here. Some people had been had been saved under the leadership of Paul and been baptized under his leadership, while others were saved and baptized under Apollos, another preacher at Corinth. And so they were saying, listen, I think Paul's the greatest preacher that we've ever had here at Corinth Church. Another would say, I think Apollos, he's my man, he's my dog, he's my homie. I think he's the greatest preacher, the greatest pastor that we've ever seen here uh, at Corinth uh, Church. Notice what he says in verse 5. Who then is Paul? Who is Paul? Who is Apollos? Paul asked, but ministers by whom you believe just tools in the hands of God, even as the Lord gave to every man. He says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but it is God who gave the increase. And he says in verse 8, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. He says, look, this thing's not about you, and it's not about me, it's not about Apollos, it's about God who has given the increase. What I want you to understand very plainly today, this church is not about you and it's not about me. It's about the Lord and he is the one who gives the increase. He says, you're carnal. You've got your desires. You've got your preacher. You've got the things the way you want them, but it's, this is God's house. That's what Paul's saying. Now notice, why does strife occur? Where does strife come from? And just whose fault is it anyway? <laughs> Wh whose fault is it when strife occurs? And you say, well, it's Satan's fault. James says, no, it's not Satan's fault. We blame a lot on Satan that, that, that really it's not his fault. Listen, it's not Satan's fault. It's not our mother-in-law's fault when strife comes. It's not our enemy's fault. It's not someone else's fault. But here it is. James says, it's my fault when strife comes. When I am so filled with pride that I have to have my way. That's where strife comes from. That's where fightings come from. That's where wars happen. And God, think about it, child of God. God has called us to be selfless. 
But sometimes we're selfish, and that's where all our problems come from. When we are selfish, uh, when, when, when uh, that brings a problem in any of our relationships and all of our relationships. Have you ever considered, if you can't get along with anybody, that maybe you are the problem? Just maybe. Just maybe it's not everybody else's fault. But maybe it is our pride. And listen, it brings, it, brings, it brings problems into all our relationships, whether it's at work, whether it's a, a, among nations, where this nation goes to war against this nation. Why is it? There's a pride problem. There's a selfishness problem there. Maybe it's a problem in our friends or our family or our marriage or even in churches, James says. But let's notice three things, okay? We'll be done. First of all, notice contention. Notice contention. Look at the strife here in relationships. Look at verse 1. And he begins with a probing question in verse 1. <clears throat> he says there, from whence come wars and fightings among you. James loves to do that, doesn't he? He loves to probe. He loves to make us think about it. He says, where's it coming from? This strife that you have in your relationships, where do they come from? That strife that you have with your husband or your wife, where's it coming from? The strife in the churches, where's it coming from? Where does conflict originate? And he, what he wants them to do here in verse 1, he wants them to seriously consider it. He doesn't want them to say amen and go to the house and never think about this again. He wants them to ponder this prevalent problem that was plaguing them. And listen, we, we as mankind, we love to say, well, it's your fault. It's everyone else's fault. It's somebody else's fault. It's your fault. But notice what he says. He says, where do these wars and fightings come from? The word wars there means battle, strife, conflict. The word uh, fightings means a severe clash, a dispute. And so wars indicate an ongoing state of hostility. The, uh, the war is long, isn't it? While a fight in the war, fightings point to, a, to specific conflicts in this great war. There are individual battles in the war. That's what fightings are. But think about it. Both of these words are, are they singular or plural? They're plural. Okay, so what that tells me and what it ought to tell you is that this was a chronic widespread problem as James writes this to believers that are scattered abroad. This wasn't a problem that just a few of them had. This was wars and fightings among your members, he says. He says, where does that come from? Let me ask you this and we'll move on. Do you have a problem in relationships do you have a problem in, in a relationship? Is there, does there seem to be a relationship in your life where there is unending war? Why is that? Why is that? Well, James gives us insight to why. Notice the source of conflict and contention and strife. He says in verse 1, he says, come they not hence. He didn't ask us a question and then leave us in the dark. He says, here's where they come from. Even of your lust, that war in your members. Your lust, he says. And I, I've heard this before, but there's two dogs living inside of all of us. If you're a child of God, you've got the Spirit of God who has moved in into your life, and He'll never leave you. And the Spirit of God is trying to bring you to follow Christ. The Spirit of God is trying to mature us and to make us more like Jesus Christ. And then our flesh is still there, isn't it? Anybody sick of your flesh? And you say, well, I'm saved. You're saved, but listen, that, that same flesh that, that you had before you got saved, is, you still have that flesh. And it, ha it wants what it wants. And so you've got the Spirit of God, and you've got the flesh, and they're warring inside of all of us. There is, there is, uh, there's an ongoing war in all of us. You say, well, which one wins? Well, a little boy asked that one time. Which dog wins? The one we feed the most. Are you feeding your flesh? Or are you feeding your spirit? Because listen, when we feed our flesh the most, 
we will have problems in our relationships. We will walk according to worldly wisdom. And you know, <coughs> Satan, people say, well, Satan is the source. I can't get along with anybody because of Satan. I can't get along with nobody because he's the old devil. You know, he's, he's just disrupting and doing all that he can. Yeah, he does all that. But notice what, what James says here. He says it is always the same source. There is some root of carnality, some internal war that causes unrest in us, causes unrest with God, and causes unrest with others. It causes unrest. The problem uh, is between us and God. Here's the thing about it, okay? There no two believers that are walking in the Spirit of God will fight and war with one another. Somebody, so, somebody gets out of step with God, and that's why we can't get along with each other. James seems bothered more by, by the selfish spirit and the bitterness that by who is right or wrong. And what James is saying is this, it doesn't matter who's right or wrong. It doesn't matter. The, the thing that's breaking his heart is that you are, uh, th there's, there's this selfish spirit and this bitterness. And what James, I think, is portraying is this, there's only one winner when two brothers in Christ are not getting along, and that's Satan. He's the only winner. He's the only one that wins the cause of Christ suffers. Our relationship suffers. And there are many contentious people who say that they're led of God to, to cause contention. No. God didn't lead you to do that. God doesn't lead us to do that. James tells us a real source. He says your lust. And that word lust, it means to crave pleasure. It's talking about sinful pleasure, a strong desire for fulfillment of desires. And so inside of us, there's a walking civil war. That's, who, that's what we are. There's a civil war inside of us. And self-love and gratification is devastating to church unity. And you know what the weapon of choice is? The tongue. The tongue is our weapon of choice. And when our passions are not on Jesus, but our passions are on our way and our fleshly desires, this is what happens. We, we begin to see believers as our adversaries. Can I tell you this? There, this is not a competition. There is no competition in, in the body of believers. There is no competition. There's no room for it in churches. And what James is saying is this, who cares? <laughs> who cares who is right or who is wrong? Who, who cares? L listen, th think about this. Who cares who can preach the best? Paul's already used that illustration. Who cares if it's to God be the glory? Who cares if I can preach better than someone else or someone else can preach better than me? Who cares if I can sing better than someone else or someone else can sing better than me? You know what? He's saying it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Don't look at that type of stuff because if we're here for God's honor and glory, then it doesn't matter about us anyway. Unless we know the source of contention, we can never deal or conquer this. Now I want you to notice secondly here in this text, concentration. Look at concentration. Look at their focus. And look at the search in verse 2. He says, ye lust and ye have not. And he, he's going to use a number of present tense verbs in verse 2. And, and they're all talking about a search. They're all talking about trying to find something and focus on something. And he says, ye lust and ye continue to lust. It's present tense. He says, ye lust, you continue to lust. And this word in verse 2, it means to desire greatly. The word for lust, it means to long for. And let me tell you, it's a different word than verse 1 and verse 3 for lust. You got to know that or, or this passage of Scripture will be cloudy to you. It's a different word there. And not all lust is bad, is it? Uh, you're looking at me like you're the preacher. You tell me. You're, 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 you're preaching this sermon. 
In verse 5 of this chapter, he talks about how the Holy Spirit lusts, lusts after us. All right, so, so understand this. Not all lust uh, is, is necessarily bad. We can have, in verse 2, he's saying you have this desire. He doesn't necessarily say if it's good or bad, but you have a yearning. You have a strong desire here. He says you lust and you continue to lust, but you don't have it. Not all us is after a bad thing, but if we don't handle it the right way, it becomes a bad thing even if we're desiring a good thing. We may have a desire for God to use us, and then when God uses someone else, we, we may get bitter and get mad because we, we really want God to use us. And maybe even we began to lash out. Why? Because God's using that person. God's using that preacher. So we lash out. We want God to use us. And instead of praying about it and asking God to use us, we get angry and we get bitter. Notice he says you lust, you're desiring, but you're unsatisfied. You lust, James says in verse 2, and you have not. You desire, which means being zealous for something, setting your heart on something. You desire it, but you cannot obtain. Notice repeated failure. You know what that leads us to? What happens when you fail over and over and over and over again? Frustration, right? Yeah, that, that sets in. Frustration. What happens when we don't get what we want? We throw a fit. We throw a fit. It's hard to get along with. We're hard to get along with and impossible to deal with because I want my way. <clears throat> Someone wrote this, carnal desire is all that is needed to keep the church in turmoil. Now notice the scope. Look in verse 2. He says, you lust, you have not. How far are you willing to go to get your way? Well, look at what he says. You kill. Now, were they actually killing each other? I hope not. <laughs> but what James is saying is you'll go to any extreme to get your way. You'll go to any extreme to fulfill this desire. And remember, it may not be a bad thing. The desire may not be a bad thing, but how you go about it may be a bad thing. And notice the sc scope. He says, you lust, you kill, you fight, and you war. What James is saying is, there is when we walk in worldly wisdom to have our way, there are no limits to get what we desire. There, there's, there's no limits to try to get my way, and, and I'll, I'll go to any extremes to get it. Listen, y'all, God has not called us to be self-centered. <laughs> It do us well to remember that. We don't, we don't drive this ship anyway. God does. And listen, anything, any way that God uses us, may we step back and defer all the glory to Him. Because He's the one that deserves the glory. All right, but self-centeredness never leads to anything spiritual. It never leads to anything God. And then notice the sadness there in verse 2. Look at the sadness. He says, you lust and you have not. That's sad. <laughs> you kill and you desire to have and you cannot obtain. That's sad. You fight and you war. And yet you have not, he says. That's sad. What we desire never comes. And listen, if our purpose is to live solely for self and to desire with envy others and what they have and their service to God, then we will never know satisfaction, will we? You know, I can remember growing up as a teenager and then into my 20s. You know, my truck used to be, I love trucks. I love loud pipes. <clears throat> I love music kind of loud sometimes too when I was in my younger days. But uh, you could hear me coming. <laughs> and I liked it that way. But I remember, I remember thinking, man, if I could get rid of this truck that I have now, and if I could get that truck, I'll be satisfied. 
And before too long, I got that truck. And guess what? I wasn't satisfied. I saw another truck that caught my eye. And isn't that how, that, isn't how that, that goes? When we live according to worldly wisdom and we think that things will satisfy us. And we, listen, the greatest thing in life is not, are not things. But it's just a vicious cycle. And here's the sadness. He says, you desire, you lust, you'll kill, you'll do anything to get it, and you still can't obtain. That's what he says. And he says, further, you will be a source of turmoil in the church. You want to know true satisfaction? I'm a child of the king. You want to know true satisfaction? No matter who, uh, no matter what happens uh, this coming year or in the future, I am safely in the palms of an almighty God. You want to know what true satisfaction is? If I don't wake up in the sleep tonight, if I, if I don't wake up and, and this heart stops beating, listen, I'm at home with the Lord. To be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. I want to tell you, you want to know true satisfaction? Raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and watch as they come to Jesus Christ and repent of their sins and they're born again and one day you'll spend eternity in heaven together. That's true satisfaction. The rest of this stuff's going to pass away. The rest of this stuff's going to burn up. Don't set your affections on it. Don't set your heart on it. Look at things that can't be destroyed. And so he says you, you want all this but you can't have it. Isn't there a better way don't you think there's a better way? Yes, there's a better way. The believer who lives according to divine wisdom will not seek selfish desires because they understand it's not about them anyway. It's about the Lord. It's about His honor. It's about His glory. And so notice here's the better way, the third point of this message, confrontation. Confrontation. You say, well, how's that a better way? Well, just hang on. James confronts them here at the end of verse 2 and verse 3. And it's not James confronting them because James is writing under the Holy Spirit, of, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so this is really the Lord confronting them about how they're walking in worldly wisdom, how they're behaving. And, and the Lord has, He confronts them. And listen, uh, when the Lord confronts us, we've been confronted. <laughs> When the Lord has a problem with how I live and how I walk and how I think and what I say, I've got a problem. And notice, notice he gives us two things here. First of all, there is the prayer that can't be answered. Look at verse 2. Boy, this is deep the theology right here. Ye have not because ye ask not. I think I could have wrote that one. You have not because you ask not. He says you didn't pray. You, you, you thought that you were sufficient in yourself and you had this desire, good or bad, uh, you had this desire to serve the Lord perhaps and instead of seeking God, you attempted to satisfy that gnawing want through your own efforts. And instead of wrestling with God in prayer about your desire, you fought against your brother. You fought against man. You have not because you ask not. The word ask here is in present tense. It is repeated failure to ask. Over and over again, James says, you didn't ask. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, you remember what our Lord said. He said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. That's what the Lord told us. But he says you didn't ask. And he's talking about depending on God, depending on Him to fulfill my desire. I want you to think about this. Can you imagine in, the, in, the, in your mind's eye, imagine standing before the Lord in judgment. And the Lord points over here somewhere. I don't know if it'll go down like this or not. This is Justin Coburn theology. You can't buy a cup of coffee with it, okay? The Lord points over here and there's a warehouse. I'm talking about tall, long, wide. You say, well, what's that? 
And the Lord says, that's what you could have had if you'd have just asked for it. The Lord says, that's, that's what I could have accomplished through your life if you would have just asked. If you would have just sought, man, that, <laughs> I don't want that, do you? Notice, he, he moves on and he says, there's not only prayer that can't be answered, but there's also prayer that won't be answered. Stands a reason God can't answer a prayer that we don't offer and we don't pray. But there's a prayer that won't be answered either. Look in verse 3. He says there, ye ask and ye receive not. Well, what in the world's going on? You just said I don't have because I don't ask. Now you're saying I'm asking and I still don't receive. What? What's going on? Well, finish the verse. He says in verse 3, Because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. And that's your sinful desire again. That's your sinful pleasure from verse number 1. And so he says, you're praying with impure motives. You ask amiss. That is with the wrong motives. Asking incorrectly. Asking with an evil manner. Here's the thing about it. We can pray the right thing with the wrong motive and not receive anything from the Lord. Did you get that? We can pray the right thing with the wrong motive and not receive. And so he says here, this prayer doesn't reach the ceiling because you want to consume it upon your lust. You're praying with the wrong motive so that you can consume, which that word means to spend or to waste. It is the same word that speaks of the prodigal son when he went and he wasted all of his substance. He spent all of his substance. He says, you're just going to, if, if I answer this prayer, you just want to spend it or waste it on your pleasure and your passion and your craving. You're praying for your own glory and for your own desires. I'm going to give you, I think, about five, five principles of prayer, okay? And I'm almost done. Here's the first principle, the first rule of prayer. We must pray God's will. We must pray God's will. Listen, prayer, I don't know what you've heard about prayer, what you think about prayer, but prayer is not to get our will accomplished in heaven. Prayer is about getting God's will accomplished on the earth. I'm going to tell you, prayer will change you. <laughs> pray in God's will. Here's the second one. We must pray in faith. If we're not going to believe, if we're not going to have faith, uh, then don't bother praying. Those, that's found in other passages. We must pray that God can and that God will. Here's the third thing. We must pray from a pure heart. Here's the fourth thing. We must pray in Jesus' name. Here's the fifth thing. We must be fervent in prayer. We must keep on praying and keep on knocking and keep on seeking God and seeking the answer. The right motive in prayer is for the glory of God. I heard this week in preparation of this sermon, there was a woman whose husband was lost. He was on his way to hell and she prayed for that man. She asked everybody, pray for him. Pray for him that he'd get saved. And so she said she prayed and she prayed and she prayed and she asked God. She asked God to, to save this man so that he wouldn't go to hell. She asked God and cried out to God, save this man so that he could spend eternity with them in heaven forever. Save this man so that you can, uh, you know, so that he'll be a better person. And she prayed all of these angles. And then finally she began to pray, save this man, God, for your honor and for your glory. Guess what? Wasn't too long after that she, he came to Christ and he was saved. You see, we need to we need to pray for God's glory. We need to pray His will and His glory. And we need to seek God, not pleasure. It's the only way to be satisfied. The only way to be satisfied is to be sitting where you're sitting right now, reading what you're reading right now, 
and just fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way to be satisfied and to glorify God. And so let me, let me say this and, and I, in closing. It's prayer time in America. And he brings up this idea of prayer. And listen, there's a prayer that can't be answered. That's the prayer we don't pray. There's prayer that won't be answered. That's the prayer with the wrong motive. But then there's prayer that will be heard and will be answered. And it is prayer time in America. I mean, we've whined long enough, haven't we? Oh, we've whined about politics and how this is going to happen. That's going to happen. Let me tell you, time better spent would be on our knees in our prayer closets crying out to God not to just change this mess, not to just do something with the election, not to just do something with everything else, but to change us so that we can change the climate of this world that we're living in. God, do something in my heart. Do something in me so that I can walk worthy of you. Let me ask you this question. What did you pray about this morning? Did you pray this morning? What did we pray for? What we, did we rush through our prayer? Listen, it's prayer time in America where we should be, get broken before God, begging for the lost to come to Christ. When's the last time we wept on the altar for a lost soul to come to Jesus Christ? Begging God for revival. Begging God for the Holy Spirit fire in our church. Listen, as America, we have sinned against God. We have forsaken God. And this is what God does. We read 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. We love to quote that verse. But do you continue reading in that chapter? Go do that when you go home. Read after 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. And he says, if you'll do this, then I'll do this. But if you, if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, I'll take away what you've got. I'll take away what you've got. And so may we not just pray God fix it, but God change me. It's time that we get serious with the Lord in prayer. And we, we ask God to forgive us of our sin. We ask God to forgive us of our complacency. Our laziness are not doing what God's called us to do. As we get ready, let's have a song of invitation. When's the last time you cried over a lost soul? When's the last time that you prayed to know the mind of God, that sleep evaded you because there was somebody that God put on your heart that was fighting a battle, and instead of sleeping, you just interceded for them. Listen, that's what we need in America. That's what we need as children of God. Everybody knows the problems. We don't have to state the obvious. <laughs> but what are we going to do about it? What does God expect us to do about it? Let me tell you this. Prayer is a battlefield. Prayer is a battlefield. You believe that? Have you ever tried to spend 10 minutes in prayer? you ever tried to spend 30 minutes in prayer? you ever tried to spend an hour in prayer? Prayer is a battlefield. Because here's the thing about it. The devil don't care that you came to church this morning, but he'll tremble when you get on your knees. He cares about that. Why? Because there's an hour in prayer. Not cookie cutter prayer, getting serious with God, saying, God, we're in a mess and we need you more than we need lunch. <laughs> we need you, God. And so let's, let's pray. Let, let's pray for the lost. Let's pray for our country. Let's pray for leaders. Let's pray for our church. Let's pray for sin and, and uh, for those who are struggling. And maybe you're here this morning and you're lost and you don't know the Lord as your Savior. We invite you to come to Christ and receive Jesus Christ. Get a relationship with God. You don't need religion. You need a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You can have it this morning. Let's stand together today. And as we stand, what number will we sing?